Please welcome Mr. Richard Stallman. I'll talk, I'll talk. Don't shine that light at me. I'll talk. I'm always happy to talk. Um, first, if you take a photo of me, please do not put it in Facebook or Instagram. By the way, it's not showing me a clock, it's just showing a picture of me, which doesn't tell me what time it is or when I have to stop. Oh, I see. It's 49 o'clock. <clears throat> um, it's tilted away from me. Anyway, that company is a monstrous surveillance engine doing surveillance on its useds and everyone else on the internet as much as it can, putting information about somebody else in Facebook is ratting on that person to Big Brother. You shouldn't do that to your friends. And if you put in a photo of that person, you're giving Facebook more ability to recognize that person through its face recognition. So that's a particularly bad thing to do to your friends. I'm, we don't know each other, I'm not your friend, but don't do it to me either, please. <clears throat> And second, if you want to make an audio or video recording and distribute copies, please do it only in the ways that are favorable to free software, logiciel libre. And that means in the AUG formats or the WebM format only. Don't distribute it in MP anything, because they're patented. And especially don't let it be distributed through Flash because Flash requires proprietary software, and don't put it in Windows Media Player or QuickTime or Real Player either. <clears throat> so YouTube's not a good place to distribute videos. The way, if someone visits the YouTube site, it leads that person to run non-free software. And when you distribute copies, please put on them the Creative Commons No Derivatives License, because this is a presentation of a point of view. So, I want to talk about uh, whether computing respects our freedom or oppresses us. That depends on a number of things. There are several issues in here. The first one is, what happens inside your own computer? Do you control what your computer is doing? Or is it controlled by various companies, first of all, and then they let you have a little bit of secondary control of certain things? That's the way it usually is, you see, because mostly computers are running non-free software. So what is free software? Free software is software that respects the user's freedom and community. So it's free in the sense of freedom. I do not refer to price here. I don't mean gratis software. Whether you pay to get it or not, that's a secondary detail. I'm talking about how it treats you once you got it, which is what really affects you for a long time. So in French, it's logiciel libre not logiciel gratuit. <clears throat> when a program is not free, we call it user subjugating proprietary non-free software. Le logiciel privateur, because it denies people their freedom. <clears throat> it denies freedom to whoever is unfortunate enough to be using it. A non-free program gives the owner power over the users. That's the injustice of it. <clears throat> With a program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other. There's no other possibility. When the users control the program, that's free software. In order for the users to control the program, the users need the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose. There are proprietary programs that don't even give users that much freedom. But then freedom one 
is the freedom to study the program source code and change it to make the program do your computing the way you wish. With these two freedoms, each user separately has control over this program, really over that user's copy of the program. And that means if you know how, you can make that program do exactly what you want. But most users don't know how to program. Separate control alone is not enough. But even for a person who knows how to program, separate control is not enough, because you probably use thousands of programs, and nobody, not even the world's greatest programmer, has the time to study and master that much code, let alone to implement all the changes she might want. So we need collective control also. A free program gives each user separately control and also gives collective control to the users, which means that any group of users are free to work together to exercise control over what that program does for them. And this applies to any size group. It could be two individuals. It could be five individuals and three companies. It could be every person in Europe, uh, any size group. And they all have collective control in parallel. Those groups that choose to use it, of course, are fewer. Collective control requires the other two essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and then give or sell them to others when you wish. Freedom three is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. So if the program comes with all four of these freedoms, then it's free software because the users separately and collectively have control over it. They can make it do what they want and they can make it not do what they don't want. But if any of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program is not free software. It's proprietary user subjugating software because when the users don't control the program, the program controls the users and the owner controls the program. That's why the program becomes an instrument of unjust power. <clears throat> that's bad enough, that's already unjust that this owner has power over users through the program, but it leads frequently to something worse. Nowadays, the owner is well aware of the power that it exercises over people and is therefore constantly faced with the temptation to exercise that power to get further advantage over those suckers. <clears throat> putting in malicious functionalities, making the program malware. Now, I should clarify that proprietary software and malware are different concepts. Any program could be distributed as free software or as proprietary software. It's just a matter of how it's distributed. The same code can be free or proprietary, and sometimes it's available both ways in parallel at the same time. Whereas malware is a matter of what the code is programmed to do. Malware means a program designed to mistreat the users when they run it. And that's conceptually independent of whether the program is free or proprietary. But in practice, malware goes with proprietary software. <clears throat> because the owner of the proprietary program has power over users and is tempted to take advantage of that power by making the program malware. And frequently they do this. There are several kinds of malware several kinds of malicious functionalities, that is. For instance, the program may spy on the user, sending data to a server. It may be designed to stop users from doing what they obviously want to do. For instance, save a copy of this video on disk. Many programs are designed to stop people from doing things. Or stop the user from using her own data in any other program by writing it in a secret format. 
Then there are back doors. Back doors accept commands from somebody else to do things to the user actively, which may be nasty, without asking permission, of course, often without even saying that they're doing anything. And then there is censorship. Some proprietary programs are designed to impose censorship on the user. <clears throat> now, proprietary software development has become so unethical that these are not rare exceptions. They're the usual case. Nearly everyone that uses proprietary software is using known instances of proprietary malware. For instance, one proprietary package that does all four of these nasty things that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. It spies on the user sending data to a server. Of course, it has DRM, digital restrictions management, to stop users from doing things. It has three back doors that we know of, and Windows 8 on mobile devices is designed as a platform for censorship, censorship of applications. Users can't freely install whatever application programs they choose. They can only install what Microsoft has approved and placed in the App Store. So. This is extremely malicious, but it's even worse. One of the backdoors is universal. That means Microsoft can forcibly change the software, forcibly, remotely change the software, can make it do anything at all differently. So any malicious functionality that is not in Windows today could be remotely imposed tomorrow. So Windows is universal malware. Any nasty thing could be put into Windows tomorrow and users would have no way to stop it except by defenestrating their computers, throwing the windows out of the computer. So that's one example. Apple's operating systems are malware for the same kinds of reasons. Android. Part of Android is free software, part of it is proprietary malware. Google Play has a universal backdoor. Flash Player is malware. It has spy functionalities and digital restrictions management. Flash Player is gratis, but it's not free software. This is a very instructive example. It shows that being zero price is, doesn't mean it's going to treat you right. Ethically speaking, that's of no importance at all. <clears throat> the fact that Flash Player is gratis means that Adobe does not make users pay to be mistreated. Thank you so much. I don't have Flash Player in my computer. <clears throat> and. Angry Birds is malware. It transmits location data to a company. The Amazon Swindle, Amazon's e-reader, is full of malware. Swindle is the appropriate name for it because it swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, there's the freedom to get a book anonymously by paying cash. Amazon doesn't accept cash. Amazon makes users identify themselves. So it has a giant database of all the books each user has read this way. We must not allow such a database to exist anywhere. It threatens other human rights. Of course, it does a lot more spying than that. It actually tells Amazon what page of what book is being read at any time. Then there's the freedom to give the book to someone else after you read it, or lend it to various people when you wish, or sell it to a used bookstore. Amazon blocks those with digital restrictions management, digital handcuffs as we call them, and <clears throat> with unjust contracts that say the user doesn't really own the book. Amazon does not respect private property for ebooks. Amazon says all the books belong to Amazon. Then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish. Amazon eliminates that with a back door that can remotely erase any book. 
We know about this because in 2009, Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a book in an Orwellian act. And what was the book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. It's as if they had wanted to demonstrate as clearly as possible the injustice of that product. There was a lot of criticism, so Amazon promised it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. If you've read 1984, that's not very comforting, but don't worry, Amazon doesn't keep the promise anyway. The official name of that product is the Kindle, which means to start a fire. Perhaps it's meant to suggest that the real purpose of that product is remotely, virtually burning people's books. I'm never going to use anything like that. Most commercial ebook readers have the same nasty problems. By the way, there's also a universal back door in the software, in the swindle. Then there's nearly all portable phones. A portable phone is a computer with software that can be changed. Even if the user can't change the software, somebody else can through the phone radio network. So it's a universal back door. There's also a spy feature that will transmit the GPS location on remote command. Although the system is very good at figuring out people's locations by triangulation all the time. So it's tracking the user all the time, and it has a universal backdoor, which has many times been used to convert a phone into a listening device, full-time listening device. You, not just when you're speaking into the microphone, it can hear you from over there, and it listens all the time and transmits all the time whenever it hears anything. And if you want to get privacy and you switch it off, ha ha, it pretends to switch off, but really it keeps listening and transmitting. We found out within the past year that the NSA has a special advanced version of this software which recognizes certain keywords and only transmits the interesting conversations. <clears throat> well, what this means is to carry a mobile phone is to be tracked and listened to all the time, potentially listened to, right? You may not know whether your phone has been diddled this way. So this is Stalin's dream. This is why I don't have one. When I heard about what mobile phones really do, I decided I can't accept this. It's my duty to stick a finger in Big Brother's eye. So no mobile phone for me. And I think it's everybody's duty to stick the finger in Big Brother's eye. But I have to do the right thing even if other people are not. Sure, it's convenient, but look at the price. Look at the price to society. The NSA can figure out that two people know each other if their mobile phones are close together. We know this, I believe, thanks to Edward Snowden. So do you really want the NSA or whoever is big brother in the country you are in to know all the who the people are that you know? Is it good for society, for democracy? for the government to know that. The first thing a government does to try to crush any dissident movement is to see who are the known dissidents, who do they know? They may be dissidents too, let's see. <clears throat> so, if you want to avoid this malware inside your own computer, you've got to insist that the software in it be free. You've got to reject non-free software, but how do you do that? The computer needs an operating system. In 1983, all the operating systems for modern computers were already proprietary. It was impossible to buy a new computer and use it in freedom. I decided to change that, to make it possible to use computers in freedom, which required writing a free software operating system. So I decided to do that. I was an operating system developer, but it was my duty to do this work to make the world free. Now, <clears throat> <clears throat> I didn't have to do it all by myself. Once I decided to develop a completely free operating system, 
And in order for the system as a whole to respect your freedom, each and every part of it, without exception, must be free software. Because if there's one part that's not free, that part would trample your freedom and might contain the malware. So every part has to be free. This is a big job, so I decided to ask other people to join in and help. <clears throat> and then I gave the system a name which is a joke. The name of the system is GNU, which stands for GNU's not Unix. Why Unix? Well, Unix was a popular proprietary operating system, and I decided to make my system compatible with Unix, so all the Unix users would be able to switch very easily to my system. And traditionally, this was the way you gave credit in a situation like that. you making a system compatible with Unix, so you call it GNU's not Unix, or something like that. The fact that this is the most humor-charged word in the English language was just a bonus. <clears throat> and the correct pronunciation is GNU when it's the name of our system. The dictionary will tell you to pronounce it new, but if you say, I'm running the new system, you've already made a mistake. We've been working on it for more than 30 years and using it for more than 20, so it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU. There are lots of people who run the GNU system and they call it Linux. That's an error that denies us the credit for our work. Linux is the name of one component of the system as we use it. It happened to be the last essential component to be made available. So people got confused. They thought that Linux was the whole thing. Linux is the kernel. It's the component that allocates the machine's resources to other programs. It's an essential piece, but it's nowhere near the whole system. So if you want to give credit to Mr. Torvalds, who wrote Linux, please give us equal mention. Please call it GNU plus Linux. But why, is, why does it matter? After all, credit's not that important in itself. This is the one and only operating system ever developed for the sake of freedom. All the other operating systems were developed for technical purposes or commercial purposes. GNU was developed so we could all have freedom in using our computers. It's important for users to know that. When people call the system Linux, that tends to be forgotten because they know that Linux was developed by Mr. Torvalds, and Torvalds doesn't agree with these ideas of freedom, so when the system is attributed to him, the connection with freedom gets forgotten, and that weakens the defense of freedom for everyone. We face a lot of threats to our freedom. Of course, that's nothing new. Freedom is frequently threatened, always has been, and if you want to keep it, you have to be ready to defend it. <clears throat> but in order to defend freedom, you have to value freedom. And in order to value freedom, you have to understand the concept of freedom. Now, most people have heard of the concept of freedom as applied to life in general, but to the, the software in your own computer, this is something most people have never heard. And most people who talk about Linux don't mention this. So when you say, let's use the GNU plus Linux system, you can also say, because this will respect our freedom. This is free, freedom-respecting software. Of course, People like Torvalds, they don't want to say that, so they have another term. They call it open source. You'll note that there's nothing in the term, quote, open source, unquote, that hints that it's an ethical issue. The word open sounds very nice, but doesn't connect with a strong ethical insistence, which is why it's great for them, but lousy for making people stand up to fight for their freedom. So I never use that term. I try to avoid the word open unless I'm talking about a door or a window. <clears throat> so say free Libra software. We use the word Libra 
borrowed from French or Spanish, even when we're speaking English, to make it clear, it's free as in freedom. Think of free speech, not free beer. <clears throat> if we teach enough people to value and demand freedom, we may actually win freedom. But we got a long way to go to get there. Nowadays, many mobile computers are designed so you can't possibly replace the proprietary software with free software. They're actually designed to check for a company's signature on the program. So even if we write a free program that would do the job, we can't get that machine to run our free software. This is the case with Apple's monsters, the iThings. <clears throat> They're only fit for material recycling. There's no other ethical thing that can be done with them. <clears throat> and Windows mobile devices also are just as bad, and even some Android devices have the same problem. So we have a fight on our hands just to get computers that can run, that will run free software. Ten years ago, we didn't have this problem. Ten years ago, you could be almost sure of it if you bought a computer, you'd be able to put free software on it. You could install GNU plus Linux. Now we have a threat to close off the very possibility of having freedom in a computer. You've got to select your computer carefully to be freedom compatible. Nowadays, people are being pressured by a social current that has been engineered by companies to entrust their data and their computing to servers belonging to others, which is just as dumb as running a non-free program. It basically puts you at the mercy of whoever runs those servers. Proprietary software is software for suckers, and trusting companies' servers is computing for suckers. Of course, we keep finding out that these companies are collaborating with the NSA or other countries' intelligence agencies, that they've even set up PRISM connections so that data from their servers can be collected automatically by state agencies. <clears throat> How are we going to have democracy if the government knows always who communicates with whom? A whistleblower in the U.S. is in prison because the U.S. identified him by getting the phone records of dozens of journalists of the Associated Press. And they looked through those phone call records, and when they saw somebody in the agency that had this information appear in a phone record, they knew that's probably who it is. An official told journalists, we don't have to make you testify. We know who you're talking to. And this is curtains for democracy. You see, <clears throat> the state must be powerful in order to do its job. But being powerful, it's also dangerous if it goes rogue, like the U.S. government has done in so many ways. So we need to keep the state under the people's control. But how do we do that when the state does things secretly? How can we control what we don't even know about? We depend on whistleblowers to tell us. But if a whistleblower needs the courage and planning of a Snowden to avoid being imprisoned, we may not have very many whistleblowers. And there goes democracy. So, in order to preserve democracy, we must push the level of general surveillance down below the, this absolute limit. 
if surveillance is sufficient that the state can generally identify whistleblowers, democracy is doomed. That's the absolute limit for the amount of general surveillance in a democratic society. To have democracy, we have to push surveillance down below that limit, which is a lot of work because surveillance now far exceeds that limit. We are surveilled far more than the people of the USSR were. I'm sure Stalin would have loved to surveil everyone in the Soviet empire just as much as we are surveilled today, but he didn't have the technology. The state today has the technology to do this and generally is doing it. <clears throat> People think of trying to prevent this by putting legal limits on the state's access to the massive digital dossiers about everyone. It can't work. Here's why. Because these rules always say that when the state is investigating a crime, it can have access to the data. Well, the state just has to say that whistleblowing is a crime, and now automatically it's allowed to look at all the data and identify the whistleblower. You see, this doesn't really fix the problem at all. We must require digital systems to be redesigned so that they do not keep data on everyone. And that means all the digital systems we come in contact with must be designed that way. So you've got to be able to make phone calls anonymously. You've got to be able to ride the bus anonymously. Well, in Geneva you can. I got an anonymous bus card. Good. But in a lot of cities, they're trying to push people to identify themselves and use the same card for a long time. This is not good. So <clears throat> then there are the license plate cameras that recognize cars by their license numbers. In England, they had put, on so, put up so many of these cameras that they can track all car travel. They have a giant da historical database of where every car was every minute. And they could save this data for 10 years. It wouldn't be hard. They can also find a car in real time. And they already used this system to sabotage democracy. Around 10 years ago, I think, uh, people were in a car, suspected activists were in a car believed to be heading for a protest. The state insecurity forces stopped them and essentially held them prisoner until the protest was over and then let them go. Obviously, they had no crime to accuse these people of. They were just trying to preemptively sabotage democracy. So, how can we make such a system safe for democracy? Well, if the cameras only recognize license plates, if they are either invalid, so driving with that plate is a violation, or on a court-ordered list of people being sought for commission of crimes. And all the other cars just drive by and the system doesn't see them at all. This way, the system can be useful for catching criminals and drivers whose cars are not licensed, but will not be usable for sabotaging democracy. What about a security camera? Well, security cameras 20 years ago, they just made a recording on a tape. And the recording stayed there for a couple of weeks and then got overwritten with another recording. If someone committed a crime, this was quite useful. It was worth the trouble to go and collect the video. But it was not suitable for watching everybody all the time because it was too much work to go and collect all these videos regularly and copy them. But nowadays, they're putting up cameras that are connected to a network that allows them to be watched and saved in centralized places all the time. And you just hook that up to automatic face recognition once it's working well enough and you have 
Big Brother surveillance. I believe it should be illegal to set up a camera looking at a place where the public is admitted and set up to be viewable from anywhere else. If it makes a recording locally, that's okay. But, it's, if it's, but it should be illegal to make it viewable from elsewhere. That way, it'll be a security camera, but not a surveillance camera. I've proposed various other techniques for redesigning systems so that they do not do massive surveillance. See gnu.org slash philosophy slash surveillance vs democracy dot html. The crucial thing is we have to get organized to demand this. We have to say to all those uh, spies who say they're protecting us that the danger that they're protecting us from is the secondary one. And the biggest threat is the threat to democracy that comes from unlimited, unrestrained digital surveillance of everyone. Now, of course, if you have a cloud in your mind which says, well, just trust your data to some big company that if you were thinking clearly, you'd know you can't trust, well, then you're sunk. Then all your data is going to be right there for Big Brother to look at. There's only one safe way you can entrust data to somebody's server and that is to some company's server. Because maybe your friend's server, well, maybe you know each other well enough that you could trust that friend. But a company, of course not. But there is one way that you can trust it even to a company's server, and that is encrypt it in your own machine with free software. And then you can store the encrypted version on the company's server because they can't possibly understand it and neither can Big Brother. And that's a fine way to save a backup copy in case your computer gets destroyed or stolen or whatever. You can just download the encrypted file from the server, and once you've got it in your own machine, you can use free software to decrypt it. But other than that, don't give your information to a company. But there are companies that that try to worm their way into social activities, collecting data about people. For instance, people have tried to ask the attendees at my talks to register through Eventbrite. There are two bad things about Eventbrite. First of all, it won't work unless you run non-free software. The non-free software is in their web pages. It's a program written in JavaScript, and they just put it in the web page so that silently it installs itself in the user's browser, and that user is now running non-free software. And there is malware in web pages too. JavaScript programs in web pages often are designed to spy on people in other ways. But you can block it if you use our browser, IceCat. IceCat is our variant of Firefox, and it blocks any non-trivial, non-free JavaScript code. And it blocks certain constructs that are mainly used for spying. But the other bad thing about Eventbrite is it makes people identify themselves. So now this company has a list of attendees for your event. It's unethical for you to let any company have the list of attendees at your event. It's disrespect for the rights of people who are attending. So you must not do that. <clears throat> and of course, if you look at Facebook, any, any communication system that makes people use the same name all the time is a massive surveillance system and uh, count me out. Facebook made a slight relaxation officially in its real name requirement under pressure from cross-dressers. 
and they say, well, now you can use in your Facebook account the name you usually go by, but it's still always the same name, so everyone that deals with you or looks for stuff about you is going to be seeing the same stuff as everyone else. So it's still a threat to people. Why did they make this small relaxation? I guess it's because they are trying to compete to be able to do dragnet surveillance. Surveillance of cross-dressers, cross that is. Oh well, that fell flat. <clears throat> so the other bad thing that servers can do to you is if you let the actual computing for you be done in somebody else's server, then the server controls it and you don't. The idea of free software is you should control the computing that you do, the computing activities you do, which requires running free software, but it's got to be your copy. If you entrust the computing to somebody else's server, that means you've got to send all the pertinent data to the server first, so it's spying on you. Nothing's going to make them delete that data afterward. It's going to be there for a big brother to look at. And then the computing itself gets done on that data in the server by programs chosen by the owner of the server, not by you. If they're free software, that means the server owner can change them, but you can't. You can't, well, you could get your own copy and change it, but your copy is not what's running in that server. It's his copy. So he's the one who controls what it does and then it will send the results back to you, but you don't control how that's done. So service as a software substitute, or SaaS, is a way of losing control of your own computing. To have control of your computing, you've got to do it in your own computer with your copy of free software. That's the only way for computing to be set up Society's got to encourage people to do their computing in the way that the users control, not a way that puts the users under the power of someone else, whether it's the owner of a proprietary program or the owner of the server that's doing their computing. Now, there are jobs that servers can legitimately do. For instance, if you want to communicate with other people, you can't do that inside your own computer. You've got to involve their computers somehow. That's got to go over the network and go through various other things. It's inevitable. You can't do things with other people while being by yourself. <clears throat> but when it's not a matter of communicating with others on the net, if for an activity that's purely yours, that you should do inside your own computer so that nobody else has control over it and nobody else can spy on it. For instance, suppose you want to speak commands to your computer in voice. And suppose you let somebody else's server recognize the words in the voice and turn them into commands. That server knows everything you do. It's spying on you constantly. So that's your own computing. It's nobody else's business. The only ethical way for that to be set up is a free program that runs in your own computer and doesn't talk to anybody. Our browser, IceCat, blocks various other privacy-violating features that might give others information about what you're doing in your computer. So it's what I recommend for a web browser. And of course, it's free software. For more information about the GNU system and the free software movement, look at gnu.org. In gnu.org slash philosophy, you can see lots of articles about various philosophical points, including the definition of free software, the precise criteria, and the reasons for them. 
look at gnu.org slash free software even more important dot html. In gnu.org slash gnu, you can find the history of gnu and the free software movement. In gnu.org slash licenses, you can find details about various free software licenses and other licenses and why they're not free. And in gnu.org slash help, you can find a list of various ways you can help us. It doesn't necessarily mean programming. If you're not a programmer, you can help us in other very important ways. Some of them are extremely easy. For instance, outside the entrance over there, I believe, is you'll find stickers. Take as many stickers as you can use. They've got some downstairs as well. We also have some GNU merchandise for sale downstairs for the benefit at registration, basically, for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. You can also become a member of the Free Software Foundation at fsf.org. Or, f to preserve your privacy, if you'd rather pay your dues in cash, you can come see me and fill out a little form and pay your dues, and you'll become a member. At fsf.org, you can also find resources for using, developing, and promoting free software. You can also find campaigns, things we want people to work on. Now, that could involve developing software. It could be as easy as just signing a petition, which you could do in 30 seconds. <clears throat> and we also have a shop. So, visit the site. <clears throat> and my time is almost over. But I'm done, so I can yield the rest. Shall I stop?